Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and today we're going to go over my all-time favorite module in 1st Edition Dungeon Dragons. Besides the Vault of the Drow, okay, I, everyone knows I love the Giant series, I love the Vault of the Drow, I love D1, not a big uh, D2 fan, but I love D1 and D3, but it's the Hidden Tron of Tomoashan. And what I want to do with this, which is going to be a little bit different than what most people do when they talk, talk about this module, is they do these reviews, you know. Somebody opens up the module and says, and this is the dungeon, and here's some maps, and they talk about it, and it's kind of like, yeah, that's cool. But what about the subtle details of the design of this thing? What about the layout, some of the history? What I want to do is kind of share, like, information you could use if you were going to run it. And talk about things that, to me, someone who's been a level designer and a game designer in a video game industry, things about the three-dimensional space and the layout of the actual uh, locations themselves, that might really give you some insights you never really thought about before. So... Let's just get started right off the bat here, okay? This episode, we're going to talk about the overall module. Uh, we're going to talk about its theme. We're going to talk about the fact that it uses pre-generated characters. Uh, we're trying to shake the table too much. That one new tripod setup sucks. Um, we want to talk about the fact that this thing predates Indiana Jones. Um, and the backstory and the characters. And on the right-hand side, we've got some panels. I've got some images I created to uh, pulled from Black Desert Online that I think look appropriate for the three pre-generated characters. And uh, then we're going to, from that point forward, what we'll do is we're going to go through... I've drawn maps for a majority of the dungeon, and I'll go through room by room of like what the dungeons, what the rooms about, what the interesting elements are, what things you play, how you're going to play as a DM. I'm going to kind of tail this towards the DM. Now, if you're a player and you've never, ever, ever played the Hidden Shrine of Timoshan ever, you are doing yourself a disservice um, cheating. But you're also doing yourself a disservice by reading the module. But, you know, you may never get a chance to play it, so you may want to have fun kind of vicariously living through this. I'm not going to play the module. I did this with the Steading of the Hill Giant Chief and about 95% of the Glacial Rift of Frost Giant Jarl. And based upon the metrics from the YouTube channel views, a lot of people watch them. A lot of people watch them all the way to the beginning. And most of the comments around, hey, you don't have Argry memorized, or you run this run really differently. How do you like to do that? And it didn't seem like people really resonated with them of watching me run the game sessions with the characters. I might do that again at a later date, but what I thought I would do now is kind of angle things more towards what's the design behind this? Because I'm a game designer. I'm not a pen and paper game designer. I'm a 25-year video game designer. So you got this interesting kind of twist. You have a video game designer take a look at the classic D&D stuff that influenced his whole life. And maybe you can start a conversation with us as well, and we can see what we can share upon out about it. So let's go back to the very beginning. This module, this is the original old cover from a long, long time ago. Um, it was released in 1980. This is the same year that Back in Black, ACDC's Back in Black album came out. I was a freshman in high school. Uh, the Hidden Shrine of Timo Sean was C1 for a competition series. It was designed by Harold Johnson and Jeff R. Leeson, who I don't know personally or anything. Um, I was probably 15 or something when this thing came out. Really, really great module. Uh, D&D, I've been playing it for two years at this point. So I was playing in middle school in 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade. So when this one first came out, I remember the very first thing that struck out in my imagination was the cover art was kind of funky. He had this cool Bat God Errol Otis artwork, but then the characters kind of looked like scrubs. And I was like, oh man, look at these scrubby characters. But then I thought, well, maybe that's what the whole deal is, you know. Then they have these three characters in this module, and as I read it as a kid, I remember going, hey, wait a minute, this used to be a tournament module at Origins? That sounds really neat. You know, as a little kid, you look at the back cover, you're like, wow, look at this Mayan-style place. Let's talk about that, right? So this module says, you know, pretty much in the whole uh, first page of it, let's just go to the first page here, right here, it starts talking about the influences of what this module was about, where it originally came from, and things of that nature. So what we're going to do is talk about that, and I put some twist on things. Now, I haven't relocated the module to some other place but I want to talk about how to flesh out some of those details um, for you if you're going to run it yourself. And let's do that. we got a map here, Gray Hark on one side. Let's take a look at that. So in the module itself, it talks about this appearing down in this Amedio Jungle, Olman Islands area. And this is an area of the Gray Hawk campaign that's not heavily detailed. Um, once you get down into, uh, let's see here. Once you get down to really, really deep south, you get this uh, hold of the Sea Princes area, and then you get this massive Amedio jungle, and it just says savages, <laughs> and that's it. There's a, you know, Darlene's one of her, a beautiful map. The person's still active on Facebook today. Definitely say hello if you see her. Beautiful, big, freshwater lake, kind of like in the middle of Africa, um, surrounded by this tremendously huge jungle, right? And 
if I'm not mistaken, I think each hex is 28 miles. I can't remember exactly. It's not really that important right now. But for me, when I read some of the details of the characters, which we're going to go through the characters now, a lot of them are going to, in my opinion, should kind of come from this region. The locations that they talk about in the module are uh, not exactly detailed. Like, they don't say they come specifically from this part in the world of Greyhawk, but they talk about what county they come from, they talk about what city, what they grew up, how they ended up in the situation, how the three of them got together, and stuff like that. So let's go through that um, real quickly here, and then we'll take it from there. So... Before you do anything else, let's give you a little backstory, right? So there's elements all over the all over the first edition and the Greyhawk Greyhawk campaign book. If you don't have it, I mean, I highly recommend you get it, and it's just really, really good. It's it, I was mentioning to someone the other day. You know, the Forgotten Realms is cool. It's kind of a clone of Middle Earth. Nothing against the Forgotten Realms, but and you know, in some ways, it's a uh, a lot of stuff kind of thrown on the table. And the thing I really loved about the uh, the world of Greyhawk was the diversity and the incredible number of close proximity nations and the lack of excessive detail but all the information about the who was running the place what the locations were about every single one of these things was full of seeds and for me these things are, are what i would call seeds so the azor sea right we got it's on the right frame here this body of water is one of the main carriers of commerce between the west and etc starts talking about this location in the media coast uh, is the location that's right down here in the map. Let's just go back to the map here. So it talks about this Azor Sea. So this sea here, if you have the Gazetteer, or whatever it's Gazetteer, how you pronounce it properly, it describes uh, about uh, piracy and the sea princes and things like that. So there's a little bit of information about the jungle, but it doesn't say much about it. Now, when you go later on and you look up the sea prince, at the the hold of the sea princes, the way it's written is sea princes, comma, the hold of, kind of like your name backwards or something on an IRS form. But when you're talking about this region that's up here, right? So you see this location up here? So you go to the entry about that and it gives you a little bit more information. And only in the second column, you get like three sentences, right? And they basically see, at this one point, they say the lessons caused their leaders to rethink their policies. However, and several of the wiser captains retired to mainland states, appointing lieutenants to command their ships, not in piratical or raiding activities in the Flaine, but on expeditions to the Amedio coast, thence to trade northward with the rare wood, spices, ivory, and gold, which they wrested from the jungle savages. Now, that's not Caribbean, is it? That sounds like Africa. So you start talking about ivory tusk. You don't have ivory tusk in the Caribbean. There's no elephants. There's no uh, beasts that have huge horns and things like that. And we start talking about gold, uh, maybe Central Mesoamerica. I mean, we all know that Spanish, what they did to Mesoamerica with the Inca Indians and the Mayan and the Aztecs, all those empires are gone now. Um, but Mesoamerica's identity still remains strong today. But, you know, we talk about rare woods. You might be thinking of maybe India, like teak and things like that. So you get this blend of our real world locations all blended together so we say things like gold and teak and spices okay we think of africa we think of the middle east um we think of the caribbean and we think of mesoamerica so all those are kind of blended together so when you're thinking about this area here let's just go down to the map one more time you're talking about medio jungle okay that means kind of like our little ambient soundtrack from sword coast soundscapes in the background that he made for the lost city of omu uh you can almost hear like you know dinosaurs and huge beasts tusked beast right huge nasty huge terrible things living in the jungle a really really dense highly populated jungle there's another detail too that's really cool if you go to the actual Amedio jungle listing itself they list it as under the timberlands section right populations unknown demi humans unlikely right now why would they say that demi humans is a uh, not humans basically it's like the other races and stuff so resources foodstuffs rare wood spices ivory platinum and gems so kind of like we have in africa where you have a lot of uh, lithium battery mining going on things like that you have come this africa vibe going on with the medio jungle um, little is known of the medio jungle except that it is inhabited by tribes of cannibal savages and that sounds dastardly doesn't it some purportedly of Saloy extraction and admixture. I probably mispronounced that. That's one of the factional historical races of all the Greyhawk. Expeditions have sometimes returned with considerable wealth and tales of mines where gems abound. So it's kind of like the blood diamond kind of thing, Leonardo DiCaprio, where you can just imagine like diamond mines and rubies and all this kind of stuff. So once again, you get a lot of Africa vibe in here, right? Um, 
Um, a large lake is reportedly the gathering place for the savage tribes when they're ready for warfare and raiding. So you can see on the map here, let's just pop the map back up for you. There's this really huge, you know, probably freshwater lake, probably waterfalls, who knows? There's no mountains in the map. If you ever built, there's mountains around the perimeter, like to the south. And actually the hell furnace is just kind of dipping all the way down through the spine of that whole region off to the west. But to the east of it where this lake is, it's probably just a freestanding lake. Um, it's not really... Uh, you know, a waterfall fed from mountains or, you know, frost decay or whatever you want to call it. Um, thaw, as you would say. Immediate savages employ the following weapons, darts, javelins, spears, clubs, short bows. Some activity, um, some natives use blow guns five to seven foot long. They describe what a blow gun is. Poison is used commonly, but generally is weak. So you got kind of some general TSR vagueness going on there. It's not that big of a deal. But you've got enough tidbits between the Timberland entry and the hold of the Sea Prince's entry, what they like to do, you about ivory, tusk, and jungles, all this kind of business, and the Azor Sea, to start putting together in your mind, like, what's the theme of this place? So you have that. And then you have the visual imagery on the actual module from the first cover and the secondary cover, which is obviously Mesoamerican, right? So let's just do a crash course on Mesoamerica. Not too much detail. I won't bore you to death. There will be no quiz at the end of the display. Um, but if we look at Mesoamerica, you, you pretty much have these four major recognized type of architectural locations, right? Um, the first one, this, this um, Kalakmul, is a Mayan site. Hidden is in the upper left-hand corner picture that's right up here. You've seen it in probably one of the Star Wars movies a long time ago in the first Star Wars. I think we used this shot as a rebel base backdrop. Hidden inside the jungles of Mexican state of Campeche. And I don't speak Spanish. I may be mispronouncing that. It's one of the largest Mayan cities ever uncovered with over 6,500 ancient structures identified. So we all know that the Mayan civilizations are quite extensive. Some of them had 100,000 to 200,000 people living there. Now in the modern day... You know, I live in San Antonio. It's got like 1.5 million people. 200,000 people, I think it's about the size of Tallahassee, Florida. So that's a lot of people. Bigger than Gainesville, Florida, that's for sure. I'm not sure where you live, but think of a place that has 100,000 students. Some major universities like the University of Texas or the University of California, Los Angeles, they probably have populations between 40 and 60,000 students. So if you think of a Mayan civilization with these stone structures and processional walkways and all that kind of stuff, 100,000, 200,000 people in an ancient period of time, that's a lot. And if you have a number of tribes living in this jungle um, and these structures all have similar types of designs, it's kind of a level of cohesiveness that kind of unifies all the Mesoamerican culture. So that first one is a Mayan site. Remember, there's Inca, which is in South America. Um, and then there is uh, Mayan, and then there's Aztec. So the second one, which is in this upper right-hand corner, when I always played uh, C1, the Hidden Shrine of Timoshan, I always imagined um, it being like this upper right corner up here, um, which is really uh, Caracol, which isn't supposed to be one of the destroyers from EVE Online, though it has a similar kind of sounding name. But this one is also in, this is in Belize, and this still architecturally, uh, ar archaeologically being uncovered today. It's from 650 A.D., so when you imagine 658, this is after the Roman Empire, okay? So you have stuff happening in the Middle Ages. You have stuff between Normans happening over in Europe. You have things going on in China, things going on in, in Japan with feudalism. All kinds of things are going on around the world, but the Mayans are over here isolated. You know, have been hit by colonialism, and no European nations or seafaring nations have identified them yet. So this is the largest Mayan site in Belize. Now, Belize isn't a really huge country. It's not the largest Mayan site ever. But like um, Kalakmul is, but Caracol is the one, biggest one in Belize. So the, the bottom left here uh, is Chichen Itza, which is a Yucatan uh, state of present-day Mexico. It's 91 steps on each face, totaling 365 steps. Now, technically, 91 times 4 is 364, but we're not going to be too detailed with that because they weren't using a smartphone to figure things out. As you can see, that picture in the lower left-hand corner of Chichen Itza, you can't climb up it anymore. I think in 2006 or some 2006 or so, some woman fell to her death, and no one can walk up anymore because some woman was clumsy. But you know, things can happen. So, but still, this is one of the most well-preserved tourist locations in uh, Central Mesoamerica. So, this one's in present-day Mexico, as I mentioned. And the bo bottom, uh, the bottom right was Tikal or Tikal. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. This is the 100,000 to 200,000. Uh, this is in the rainforest of Guatemala. So this is around 200 to 900 A.D. 900 A.D., there's like philosophy and all kinds of stuff happening in the Western civilization. So why do we go into this little diversion about the history of Mesoamerican? So you've got to think about theme. So it's obvious from the images done throughout the whole module, especially when you get into the visual aids for this whole module, which are fantastic, wonderful, wonderful level of visual aids. Um, all these pictures, you can definitely see right off the bat, 
except for the Nereid or whatever her name is. Look at these hallways. This is all Mesoamerican. They all talk about the stuff in the, in the module itself, that all the artwork, Darlene's stippling work is fantastic. This is kind of anonymous looking, but whatever. Let's not be a critic of it. Um, all this Jeff D stuff is brilliant from 1980. Uh, just this line weight and pencil pen work is brilliant. It's just absolutely amazing. Reminds me of Mike Grell. Darlene's picture here. Some of these encounters that are kind of one-offs have that Two Mahars kind of vibe. Um, this, you know, headdress throne type figure here, totally Mesoamerican. This here could be probably anywhere. It's very D&D. &D. It's Errol Otis. And then you got this picture here, which just looks like the Mayan calendar with a sacrificial knife on a table with a little cat, probably a jaguar. So you could tell even the whole theme of this bat god, everything has kind of a blend between Mesoamerica set in a location that when the world of Greyhawk was created was kind of trying to be African. So Mesoamerica meets Africa. So that's, the, that's everything about the location. We actually achieved something. That's awesome. We didn't just go on and on forever. We talked about the location. Let's talk about the backstory. So this module was a tournament module. And the thing about this interesting is it comes with pre-generated characters. So let's go about let's go through these pre-generated characters because I made some cool little uh, character sheets for them. My own in my own using my own imagination. Uh, I love playing Black Desert Online. I love their character creation system. I like to use uh, character creation system they have to make characters kind of look the way I want them to. Do. I'm not selling it or anything. It's just for personal use. It's a great way to get a cool picture for your characters. And in this module, there's three characters. There's this uh, level six fighter named Rial. I think that's how you pronounce it. There's this uh, magic user thief named care the apprentice who's a dastardly half elven dude and then there's this hard stand steadfast level seven cleric who's lawful neutral named mira the the disgrace now let's go through these characters because if you read the uh, module there's really good cool backstories to this one thing i forgot to mention indiana jones comes out in 1981 okay raiders of the lost ark 1981 now when the, what's the opening scene of raiders of the lost ark India's in the tomb. He's got this guide in there. He's landed with the seaplane. I mean, you remember the scene, right? It's totally Mesoamerican, even though he's not in Mesoamerica. Trying to get these kind of things. The bats are coming out. All that stuff. 1981. Do you think Spielberg and Lucas were playing the D&D? &D? And who knows, right? So you've got to give credit where credit is due. This thing was done as an Origins module in 79. So this is pre-Indiana Jones. Check. That's done. And we talked about the theme. Check. That's done. Let's talk about the pre-generated characters. So these characters are really, really interesting. Let's just go through them because they have stories. I'm not going to read you all their gear and everything. That's not really all that exciting to, to have to go through. But the first character here, this Rial, how you want to pronounce it, um, I just think that the, the characters, when I first saw them, I'm like, oh, my God, these guys are so underpowered. And then when you start going through the actual module and see the enemies they're up against, it is gritty. This is a really, really, really gritty module. You're only playing three characters. You and... Two other friends and one DM, four people. Most people could get a four-person game going. Only have these characters. These guys are not Monty Hall loaded up with anything. You really got to play at a character class really, really well to survive. So let's go through the history of this first guy here. Uh, this guy here that you see on the right-hand pane, here's his backstory verbatim. I'll just read it to you. He's a native from the barbarian tribes of the Olman Islands. So as I mentioned earlier, what are we talking about? If this guy's a native from the Olman Islands, where is he coming from? He's coming from this region. The Olman Islands are down are down here on the right. This whole region next to the Amedio jungle is considered to be the Olman Islands. So this guy isn't far from home, but he's not at home. So the Amedio jungle is, like we said, this African meets Mesoamerican location here. Directly to the east of this is a series of islands. You can see the tip of it in this one right here. They're called the Olman Islands, and they have kind of a Caribbean vibe going on. So this is where this guy goes. This is where this guy, uh, Rial, comes from. How do you pronounce his name? I just keep calling him Rial, even though it sounds kind of silly. Um, so he comes from the Olman Islands, where he was trained as a youth in the arts of war. So he's like a fighter. That makes sense. His training was cut short at the age of 15 when he was determined to be the chosen one by the shamans of his tribe. Well, that doesn't sound very fun. He's going to be Tyrone Woodley, right? Each year, the Olman nations select one youth of perfect body to be the Gesa, the chosen one of the sky gods. Hyabo Rial did not come to meet the sky gods by way of the shaman's sacrificial knife, so he fled the Omens at the, and the wrath of his deity. So, you know, this is a young boy. He's growing up. He's a great warrior, lots of physical prowess, you know, 17 strength and 17 constitution, really high charisma. You know, considered to be the chosen one. When they told him that they're going to sacrifice him to the sky gods as a perfect specimen, I think he said, I don't want to get killed. I'm getting out of here. He's 15 years old. He takes off, right? So 
Riel came to the mainland cities and took up the profession of a sellsword. So very Conan the Barbarian type of history for him. A bodyguard to nobility or a mercenary in wars. He does not stay in one place too long. Appropriate since he's named Riel the Wanderer. Because he doesn't care for civilization. And because wherever he goes, bad luck seems to follow. Superstitiously, Riel believes his ill luck to be the work of the Sky Gods. So he continues to wander, searching for a place where he can be free from their vengeance. Okay, So this is a superstitious type of guy growing up in these Caribbean islands kind of a theme. Um, on one occasion, he uh, struck up a surreptitious friendship, friendship with an urchin uh, thief in a, part of, in a port town. Years later, upon, upon, he stumbled upon his old friend hanging onto his life by a thread. Without a second thought, he charged to the rescue. Now he finds himself fleeing to save his own life. Rael has never told anyone about the ordeal with the shaman, but has let it be believed that he was exiled because of his desire to taste the pleasures of wealth and civilization. Still, he misses his people and longs to be reunited with them. So, well, the other day I was doing a number of videos talking about how to build an awesome character or how to be an awesome player. And this kind of information, okay, it's in the module right here, right? This is what it looks like in the module. That is basically about, what, 250 words in a Word document. Whoops, excuse me, talk about that. 250 words of Word document for you to put time and energy into creating this. So, and it, if you actually read the writing uh, and break it down a little bit, the, the latter part of the writing is just telling how he ties into the current adventure. So the, the history is pretty straightforward, but it's vague enough for you, the player, to add your own personal twist to it. So you have this guy, he's on the run, he's a wanderer. Whatever happened in the past, you don't know about. What he's doing now is, uh, is completely different than what he thought he was originally. My producer pup has decided to come visit. What are you talking about? All right, here we go. So back to where we were. So really great character. And as I was saying, when you're creating your own character, it doesn't take a lot of effort for you to come up with some kind of basic theme. And those kind of themes can kind of inform how to play the character. It might help you try to find a picture on Pinterest or find a miniature that's going to be cool looking like you want this character to look like. So put that all together and make it great. And that way when you play the character, you're really going to kind of guide the character's actions to represent what he would do to a certain degree. For example, let's take a look at this guy. His intelligence is nine, okay? His wisdom is nine. He's dumber than you and not as wise as you, possibly. But he's got a lot of charisma. He's got great leadership skills, maybe some good instincts tactically, um, great strength, really good constitution. I mean, a pure, a straightforward fighter. Just using a longsword, not even a magic item. He has a composite longbow very survivalistic oriented this is not a walking wave of destruction wearing plate mail i mean his armor class that number there negative two is wrong that's not his armor class his armor class is actually only about five if i remember correctly um he's just wearing leather and he just has a dexterity bonus right or is that care and i think that's care that has leather on what does ryle wear ryle's wearing he's got the long sword he's got arrows where's his actual armor he's wearing studded leather and has a dexterity bonus um so he has 16 dexterity so this guy is not a walking wave of destruction. His stats here on the right-hand side are not right. I haven't updated that from the other campaign, but I wanted to kind of get him started to see what he might look like. So that's really, really great. Then the second character, let's go into him. His is more updated appropriately. This is Care the Apprentice. So this is a really shifty fellow. I think you got someone that's multi-classed. A multi-classed uh, level 5 magic user and level 7 thief. So in melee combat, this guy's going to be attacking as a level 7 thief. Let's, let's look at his backstory. Care is the child of a strange union. His father was a human sailor and his mother a sea elf. So that's kind of a weird mix. You see a lot of that in 5th edition. Car players want to kind of create this kind of off-the-wall, wacky character that's a blend between this and blend between that. And it's really up to you what your campaign wants to do. For me personally, I don't have a huge problem with this because at this Genesis era of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the introduction of the draw and all the other races and stuff think, make things interesting. So... Um, his father was a, as I said earlier, his father was a human sailor and his mother a sea elf. Abandoned by his mother and orphaned by his father, he grew up alone in the streets and alleyways of a seaport, uh, of the seaport Scant in the county of Onwall, with only a master, uh, masterless mongoose as his friend and companion. So this guy has a mongoose as a pet as he's growing up. From observing the mongoose, care learned the value of a live dodge and a quick thrust. He began to undertake thievery on a small scale. Ritark. A kindly scholar noticed the quick hands and wits of care and took him into service as a helper and apprentice. Ritark was a dabbler in the lesser arcane arts of low magic. Care learned certain skills and arts that a noble's formal education could not have afforded him. In fact, he learned more from Ritark though he was teaching as though he was teaching a young lad. Meanwhile, care continued to stealthy thieving at night. 
Retart grew careless as he grew old, and one evening he omitted one and a half crucial uh, passes from the uh, right to the winds of time. It was, excuse me, and was filled with the spirit of a crazed devil. That's kind of bizarre. The old man attacked Care in a maniacal frenzy, and the young thief was forced to kill his master in self-defense. Unfortunately, the city guards who wandered, who wanted to ask Care some questions about the missing necklace, took that moment to enter and find him standing over Red Ark's crumpled form and a dripping blade in his hand. Um, though pierced by two crossbow bolts, Care managed to make good his escape and now flees the bounty hunters to pursue him with a price on his head. So, I mean, this isn't a murderer. This is a neutral you know, magic user thief. He has pretty good dexterity, has pretty good constitution, and everything else is relatively run-of-the-mill and kind of low. He only has a few spells, um, magic missile, detect magic, read magic, uh, and light, knock, strength, and haste. He's got some decent uh, thief abilities. You really get to play this kind of guy as a thief. Really low hit points, only 43 hit points. Rile the Wonder, he only has around, what did he have here? Where's his hit? He only has 58. So that's a decent number of hit points for this level, but he's this kind of half-breed. Um, human and sea elf kind of a blend so him you know I kind of want him to have this kind of long trench coat monocle theme kind of looking guy a little narky a little smart because this backstory probably happened a long time ago now you may have picked this up when the Ryle the Wanderer theme about how you know he once befriended this sea this uh, thieving guy and they hook back up again so it's kind of tying all together now we go to our last character here this is just the three pre-generated characters in the whole in the in the hidden shrine of Tomoshan the last one is uh, Mira this the disgraced Mira has another kind of interesting background, a little holier than thou, if you think about it in detail. Let's pull her backstory up, right? Hers is at the bottom of this page down here. I'm just going to read it to you real quick. So, she's of the city of uh, Pontelair, how you pronounce that, which is a loyal daughter of the Sea of Magia. Uh, sea is kind of like a reference to Italian Renaissance, someone who's in charge of a region, where she was a cleric in the lawful neutral temple of the correct and unalterable way. Mira had always been faithful and obedient, following the orders of her superiors, and completely competent at all tasks. Her good service was noted, and she rose to levels within the church, assuming more difficult tasks as her power and skill increased. Always she was firm and faithful to her allegiance to stern Ala, Alia, uh, goddess of order. So this is a very uh, lawful, neutral type character. Eventually, a new Archon mounted the throne in Pont Levere. Uh, Archon's kind of a title you can earn in EverQuest 2, actually. So basically, like another cleric has taken the throne. One who claimed Allah as her patron. The temple of the correct and unalterable way grew in followers and prestige. And as time passed, Mira noticed that her peers and superiors were becoming increasingly arrogant and arbitrary. Their pronouncements came to be regarded as law, and they began to see themselves as the ultimate arbiters of justice. I don't want to cause any kind of conflicts, but in some ways the Catholic Church was like that in the Middle Ages a long time ago. Things have changed now in the modern world, but that kind of increasingly arrogant and, and paying for indulgences, if you know your world history, that kind of stuff, you can see a little influence happening there. Their pronouncements came to be regarded as law, and they began to see themselves as ultimate arbiters of justice. Mira saw them as they are falling into heresy of believing that law is concentrated in the individual and not the community. Investigating, she discovered a well-kept secret. Many members of the ecclesiastic had no longer been able to cast high-level spells, thus proving their estrangement from their deity. At last, Mira attempted to speak out against the her um, heterodox clergy and reveal the fall from divine grace, but the forces of the ecclesiarchs prevented her from doing so, and she was fortunate to escape the city with her life. That's a really interesting drow priestess kind of vibe. If you read any of the Menzo Baranzan books or any of the Desol Desolution, Dissolution books or any of the other books, you always have this thing with the with Brisa and all the characters, the drow clerics falling out of Loth's favor. And the same thing that's kind of true with all the clerics in the first edition D&D. &D. You know, they have these deities, what happens and on a day-to-day -day basis and how you're praying for spells, falling out of favor of their deities, bad news. It's like doing a chaotic evil act as a paladin. So now she serves, she serves Stern Alia alone, and she can locate other faithful disciples or somehow find money to finance a parish of her own. A landless bar barbarian is now her only companion, which is Rael, an exile from his own people too, and a kindred, if misguided soul. That's kind of from her perspective, right? And there's one final element that's uh, connected to her storyline that's not really mentioned here. Let's see here. So you have these three characters. Right? Their descriptions and all their pre-generated character sheets here, they don't have any pictures of them. The only real pictures you really have to go on is uh, the pictures on the back of the module. There's no pictures of them doing anything inside the module. So let's just take a quick little look at that, right? Um, the thing about these characters, ignore the stats over here, on the, ignore the stats here, they're all completely wrong. The thing about these characters that made that really jumped off the page to me was they had these interesting backstories that kind of explain like why these three are together, 
Well, there's nothing bonding them together. They don't have to be together. They've all kind of fallen into each other's company. So when you're a player and you're picking up one of these pre-generated characters, you really don't need to do any additional work. I mean, everything's been done for you. Now you can play on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with Steve and John and Phil can come play on the next weekend and you no longer have to worry about who's playing what character anymore. But I think it's really important to try to embrace the theme of the characters that are in the module itself. So once you've done that, once you get to the situation of the module, you can start guiding their actions as if they're the heroes that you want to, to do things the way you want to do them. So one thing about this module is very different, and we'll note that as we go into the next episode, we're going to talk about one of the very first rooms, is it uses a narrative tone. Um, let's just go take a look at that real quick, and I'll, I'll give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So when you go to the first page of this here, this section here, this first, first column right here, okay, this is narrative. Now this is kind of interesting. Because this is a tournament module, the DMs have to kind of set the stage for how did you get here and who are you playing and what's going on? What's the inciting incident? What's the situation at hand? What are you going to do about it? All these kinds of details, right? So when they established this module, they had to, well, we've got to make it so dramatic. We can feel like an opening to a film scene. So this is what they did here with this, uh, this background. And let's just go through it really, really quickly. When you're designing your own campaign, you know, this is a really good thing to take a look at. At how do you want to do this kind of stuff? So, you know, your party is lost. You should never have abandoned the ship and struck out into the marshes, but your pursuers were closing on your trail and it seemed the only way. Stumbling only through the fins, your party makes to higher ground ahead. As you cross the ridge, sun sinks below the horizon and night comes. Breathless, the party drops to the ground and you try to catch your wind with the welcome rest. And right off the bat, you can just really great pacing, really fast writing, really fun, really exciting. You can almost imagine what's unfolding because the writer's doing a good job of leaving enough detail out so you can imagine what this place actually looks like. It's not describing a bunch of palm trees. It's not going off on a tangent about the breeze or anything like that or the smell of brine in the air. It doesn't even describe what the people chasing them really look like, right? Somewhere behind you comes the sound of distant shouts. Scrambling back to your feet, you force your way further into the brush past great carved stones which lie overturned on the ground. That's a great detail. A full moon rises, sending moonbeams and ghostly shadows to flicker through the branches. Ahead in the woods, a light glows and seems to beckon, perhaps a shelter for the night. Though thorns tear and impede your progress, the source of illumination is reached at last. Before you is a clearing, there's an ancient ruin. A worn and overgrown pyramid fills the courtyard, shining in the moonlight, seeming almost brighter than the moon itself. A refuge? Perhaps. Tomorrow with daylight, the party may explore, but tonight you have to rest. And there, are, and this is the part of the narrative that's actually kind of a, uh, kind of, if you imagine you're sitting there at Origins, you know, and the DM is reading this out to you, and you're in group 14, there's, you know, 34 groups running this module against each other, and there's a tournament scoring system, you kind of want to win, maybe you get to win something really cool, or whatever, or maybe it's just tons of fun, and then the narrative shifts. Those two first paragraphs just basically just set the stage for where you are, what's going on, you begin the character sheets, and this part here kind of says, an omniscient narration kind of way, like, what's the deal? There are three of you, right, Care, the magic user, and Thief by Trade, with a price on his head, Mira, a banished cleric who seeks to escape from her former colleagues, and Rial, a barbarian fighter outcast of his people. In recent weeks past, Rial and Mira helped Care escape the clutches of bounty hunters, those are the people chasing you, and thus became fair prey as accomplices, taking passage on a ship faring south. The party had probably to get spices and ivory and gold. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they had thought to evade the hunters, but the persistent trackers followed in another hired ship or fired in the hired ship. A final desperation, the party had to abandon the vessel into wild jungles and savage land. I mean, that just sounds like a film, doesn't it? That's brilliant. Really, really, really great. So then we transition to we're just about ready to start the full gameplay. Now, they, they didn't highlight this to be read to player. The rest of the module, you'll notice it has all kinds of sections that use this box technique. Something TSR started doing from 1980 on where they say, okay, you know, as the player's into the room, read block C, that kind of stuff. Tomb of Horrors, I think, was one of the very first ones to actually do that. So let's go back down here. Here's our very last paragraph before the action begins, right? So... The sun has risen. Ah, oh, it's passive voice. <laughs> and after a hasty council and preparation, the party gathers up their equipment and starts towards the Pyramid Temple. You tread carefully across cracked and overgrown flagstones, stepping over fallen and shattered pillars, pushing aside vines and briars. As the party approaches the temple, the sound of crashing through the underbrush comes from behind you. 
Turning around, the party glimpses men moving through the woods towards the clearing. Then the earth shudders and gapes beneath, open beneath the party's feet, and you feel yourself and you are falling amidst a roar of collapsing masonry. Dust fills the air, and the sunlight disappears as the darkness swallows you. Well, that's nice. So instead of having to go, I'm going to attack them, attacking the darkness, you know, instead of running forward and wiping out all the mercenaries, who are probably only level 5 anyway, you know, the whole ground's caved in, you're falling down into the temple, and boom, that's how it kicks the whole adventure off. Now, as a DM, it's really interesting for you to kind of take a few minutes and read through, obviously, the whole module, but you'll just kind of dope it out after a while. This gives you kind of the history of what the module was and where its references come from. And we talked about this extensively, okay? Formerly tired, lost to Moashan, Ta Moashan, the home sought after. The adventure was originally used as the official AD tournament in Origins of 79. The design of the temple draws heavily on Mayan, Aztec, Toltec, mythology, and society. Certain historic examples were used as models designed the module. Hey, that's great. I'm glad they said that. It also gives you, right, an opportunity to expand. And they say this. DMs wishing to expand the ruins of Tomoshan will find it very helpful to use their local library and find out more about these fascinating cultures. That's one thing about D&D I just love. This is 41, 42 years later, and they're saying, go to your local library. <laughs> you mean... Pick up your 300 gig cell phone you have in your hand now and just look it up on the web. What is it? I mean, what a different world we live in now than we did then. So, as you saw earlier, there's all kinds of influences there. If you do a little digging around in world history and Mesoamerica, um, you're going to find tons of other ideas. This module is huge. It has tons and tons and tons of locations, tons and tons of maps. It is almost more map than you could. You should be trying to design yourself anyway. It is very exhaustive and very detailed and would take a long time to finish. As a tournament module, I'm not sure how far people could actually get in this. I mean, you'd have to be, I mean, if it was an eight hour play session, maybe it's played over three days. I'd love to find out from someone who knows how long was the tournament. Was it, a three, was it a Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Was it Saturday, Sunday? Was it 16 hours, four hours, one hour break? I'd love to try to imagine what it's like to have been there. I played a D&D tournament in 1980 a long time ago at the local mall with some of my friends, and it was kind of lame. It was really lame. There was like 13 people playing in one party, and one guy kept talking all the time. It was really terrible. Anyway, so as the DM, when you're reading through this stuff, um, this gives you the sense of what the background is, and they start talking a little bit more detail down here. It's really useful for you as well. Um, it's part of the ancient ruined city of Tomoshan, once the northeast capital of the Olman Empire, covered the southern continent centuries before the hi current history began. Tomoshan is located in the savage land south of the Olman Islands, which I've already talked about earlier. The climate is subtropical and very damp. Rains nearly every afternoon, kind of like Florida or the Caribbean. Players want to investigate the city may wish to camp nearby. After one to three hours of searching, they'll find an easily defendable glade with an artesian spring. So fresh drinking water, right? That's really useful. Uh, they don't have to run around casting create water all day long or boiling the water to drink it. Most of the city is toppled, almost completely covered in undergrowth. Intruders to the ruins will discover that the um, ancient streets are uh, now make overgrown valleys between the debris of the crumbled buildings. The largest of these valleys all lead to the central clearing of the pyramid. In the south side, of the clearing is a newly collapsed area, revealing the jagged hole and debris covered slide leading down to the area one. Um, so this is one thing about the module gets a little confusing. If you're not real on the ball and hadn't read this thing a lot, it starts to talk about, well, there's other ways you can get in here. And even describes the opening as if the players can discover them, climb the pyramid itself. They'll see the interior of the temple is probably accessible if they do a lot of digging. But then later on, it talks about how, well, you nearly do need to decide uh, which entrance you're going to use. But to tell you the truth, if I was running this, I would do the everyone slides down the pit. And we'll do our next episode. We'll look at that first entry room. We'll talk about that in detail. So this is the setup for this dungeon. I want to go back to the maps again real quick before we get into too much detail. Let's take a look at these. I put them all on one page for you. You have... Um, this huge spread of a map, right? It's a little confusing when you first look at it. As a DM, you kind of need to pull this map apart first before you start trying to uh, uh, imagine in your head how it actually is going to look out. And what we'll do, let's put this over on the uh, other video screen too because not much going on of interest, right? So you have all these different maps here, right? In fact, we'll jump over here to the video world so it's a little more interesting than just listen to me read junk, right? So you have uh, the map in the original module, the original module, was laid out like this. Let me turn this so you can see it good. Let me get rid of this stuff. We don't need this in here. Let's put this up here on this 3.5 junk. Um, okay. So these two connect together kind of like this, right? In fact, we'll put this up here like that. Now, um, north is to the top here. I'm going to slide this up a little bit. We'll slide this up like this. All right. So right off the bat, what do you have going on? So this is north. 
This is up like this, and this is a side section view of the whole pyramid. If you took the pyramid and looked at it on its side, this would be like. So this would be the steps going up. And you've probably fallen down to level area one down in here somewhere or whatever. Then there's an upper layer where there's a level here, a little sub-level, and then there's a level, and a level, and then a sloping passageway that goes down. Now, the, what is this, right? So what you've got right here is, uh, let's just take a look at that in more detail. So if you orient things to the north, okay, that's this one right here. Um, let's put this in the middle, and let's just talk about that real quick. In fact... I'm going to go ahead and pop open this uh, side camera real quick, see if, this, see if this is useful a little bit. There we go. So this is actually, if you go up to the top of the temple and come to the top of the steps, you have all these ruins and things going on. It leads down to area 54. You could do that if you wanted to. Um, I suggest what you do is always have the player start off in area, the first area of the whole dungeon, which in all actuality is way down here. Okay? Way down here. But this is where the cave-in actually happens. So this thing right here is where your cave-in happens so if you think about it where are you really starting in the relations of these type each one of these squares on the old map is five now if you have a newer version of the module the newer version of the module has this cover art on it by earl otis and it has a page that has this map and it uses 10 foot squares so you really got to pay attention to the uh, size of the of the scale of the map now everything else is the same nothing is Nothing's changed. There's no additional details with the map that's changed at all. But if you look at the maps here, sorry about flipping so quick, these squares here are a different scale than the ones. These maps on the right are using one uh, square equals 10 feet, and the ones over here in the original module are one square equals five feet. So be careful to pay attention to that. Also be sure to pay attention to where is north. So because the map is spanned over two pages, north is going to go up this way, okay? So you have this lowermost level here which in reality is over here if that makes any sense to you so you have this area here like this is actually this area here so this is kind of the layout of the temple and this is going up so if you turn from the side this is going up and then there's levels above this as you can see in this part of the map right here so let's go back to this uh so as you can see here, this you're starting down here, working your way through the whole thing, and then it slopes up, and you have the area here, there's a way to climb up, and the area here, area here, and then you're at the top of the temple. So you're kind of entering the whole temple from the bottom most area, and then working your way up. So the thing that makes it even trickier is what kind of names do they give these areas? So the the bottom most area, they're calling it the they're calling it the lower chambers. So you're like, wait a minute. So I begin the dungeon at the bottom. So it sounds kind of silly though, but that's really what's happening. So the dungeon itself is beginning at the lowermost level. You've fallen down this cave in, and you've fallen down pretty deep. Even though this is the surface of the ground, you've fallen in probably 20 or 30 or 40 feet. So you're starting at the bottom of the dungeon, some chamber that was part of a massive, huge temple for whatever reason. And you're working your way up and then going back up and up again. So it's very different. It's not going through the top of the pyramid and going right to King Tut's tomb, if that makes any sense to you. So if you look here on the right-hand panel, um, if you look really, really closely, see if you can tell me on the right-hand panel, think to yourself, okay, where is that first room? Well, if you look really carefully, it's on this spread here, right? This is the first room. But notice they've got north in the later version of the module turned the other way. So you can get yourself really, really confused really, really quickly if you're not paying attention to this. So north is turned a different direction. So when they made the map here, north is turned on its side, but they kept the layout like they did in the original one. So it's very, very tricky. You need to be paying close attention to what north is. As an architect, you always need to know what north is. If you know where north is, you can take it from there. Now, I looked on YouTube, and there's a bunch of people that have run this in Tomb of Annihilation or whatever they did in 5th edition. I don't know, I'm not a 5th edition player, but people have run this uh, with groups of people and things like that. So you may wa want to watch people play it. That's fine. Um, what I'm going to do with the show, the next episode, is I'm going to take you to this first room and we're going to talk about it as a dungeon master and a designer and give you kind of a designer insight into what makes this first room really exciting and really interesting. So, obviously, um, this is one of my all-time favorite dungeons. The reason for it, is, in summary, is the, is the following. The theme is amazing and magical. You're actually exploring an ancient tomb with tons of interesting, exciting kind of King Tut hidden rooms and passageways and treasures and all kinds of crazy business going on. Secondly, 
it's low level, but it's not level two. It's level four, five, six. You know, it's five, six, seven level. So you got a few abilities, but not a lot. You're not going to die in two hits. You know, that Claire's going to take about six full damage longsword stabs to the leg to drop, even though the hit points don't really represent that anyway. So you've got these interesting characters to work with. You've got this Mesoamerican relatable location you can do that has a historical reference. You have these very cool characters that in your mind you imagine what they look like. All these things mixed together, to me, make this probably one of the best, the most classic dungeons ever done in all of first edition. And there's one element behind it as well. If you ever played Tomb of Horrors, Tomb of Horrors was brutal. Um, it's like level 10, 11, 12 or something like that. Really hard, especially to have like seven players. This is just three. I mean, you, if you could play this with your kids, your kids might have a riot playing this because all the treasures and the neat things that happen inside. You may want to give the kids a chance to uh, not get killed. The one last thing I'll say about this, besides the uh, theming and the cool characters, is this one of the very first time they really spent some time creating the visual aids for this thing. And the visual aids are really, really well done. And you saw me flip for these earlier. But there's about maybe 17, 18 illustrations that are done here. Nice ink work. Um, these things really come in handy. And I tell you what, Jeff D's picture that he did in here is probably one of my all-time favorites of the whole module. I think it's picture 10. Yeah, here we go. Just the amount of detail that is in this one here is just incredible. The, the, the line work, this was probably done on 18 by 24, I would imagine. The line work on this is like Mike Grell quality, DC Comics, The Warlord, if you've ever seen this stuff. And the amount of detail done with the line work. And there's some clear, clean drafting lines done in here as well. And some nice freehand stuff. This line weight in this thing is fantastic. And this is done a year before in 79, probably before the original Origins. This one was probably done. But look what you have right in front of you, right? You have this diorama of the Forbidden City. Remember the scene in Indiana Jones where he uses the staff and holds it up and has the top of the staff to open the city? That's basically ripped off of the first room with the Tron of Tomoa Shan. So we're going to talk about that first room next. So these visual aids, they really, really help bring this whole thing alive. But I will tell you this, don't try to run this module as a tournament. And the reason why I say that is because the fun in running this thing is the exploration, the adventure. Don't be trying to keep score. I mean, the original module comes with like a scoring guide, how to score um, points for what the things the players do and all that kind of business. In fact, let me pull that up for you. Let's pull that up over here on the right-hand side. There is actually a, score, a scoring guide. It's way down here in the bottom, if it's been included. Here's the original character sheets, what they look like. Some blow-ups of a couple of the rooms. This is kind of ganked on its sides. So it's kind of hard to see it. I'll turn it this way on the, on the screen. It, uh, they give you every room, if you do certain abilities, you gain points or lose points for what you're doing. I, I actually say don't, don't do this. You can if you're really hardcore. If you're really hardcore and you've been playing DD a lot and you want the idea of having this kind of be like, how many points did we score? How do we do everything? And you've never read it, that's fine. But if you read it before, you know, are you going to do things like, things like avoiding the log trap or leaving the crab undisturbed. I mean, attacking the crayfish, bargaining with the crab, believing the crab, getting through the door number three, casting slow poison at the start, mapping the dungeon in detail, finding the keyhole, going all the way down here, right? You know, searching the phantasm's room or disbelieving the phantasm or crossing without disturbing the beetles. There's a lot of like improvisational, true hardcore D&D. It's not always a fight. This is not a hack and slash like you know, setting a hill giant chief for the glacial rift or frost giant jar. Like when I ran those things, those things are a hack and slash Diablo map, to tell you the truth. This adventure really use your intelligence, really use your uh, character's abilities to the fullest. Really think about what Ryle and Mira and Care would actually be able to do here because you're going to die. And it's very, very hard. And it also includes additional information for the DM in the guide where all the rolls to hit numbers are, which is kind of like to hit AC zero. Um, there's a doppelganger in here. There's a vampire here. There's all kinds of nasty stuff in here. There's yellow mold. It's, it's nasty. Um, but it's, it's, it's a kind of module where if you think and you work together, you can probably get through the whole thing and survive. And it's also one of those modules, kind of like the old classic wizardry game from Surtech, where go in, wipe out a few rooms, get out, go camp, recover, because there's poison gases in there and there's all kinds of nasty stuff going on. Go back to the next play session. So... This is not the kind of adventure that you need to be trying to burn through on a weekend. This would probably take you 
all summer. <laughs> I mean, it would take you a long time to get through this thing. There are a lot of rooms in here. Yes, there's a lot of long passageways connecting things. That's good because the level of compartmentalization will allow you to go into this first room, figure out how to get the door open, you know, go to this first area here, stop for the day and come back and do the next room. And you'll see when people are trying to run it, they have these three hour streams on Twitch where they're like in this room for three hours. I, I, I kid you not. Now, one of the problems when people are streaming these things is that there's people looking away and there's five people and someone's got to take a turn. They're not really there in real life and they're doing it digitally with, you know, with Roll20 or whatever they're using or Fantasy Grounds. It doesn't matter. Um, it just slows everything down. It, the spirit of the adventure is kind of lost a little bit, but they're playing. That's cool. They're having fun. It's kind of neat to not know what's going to happen for the party. You, when you remember when you're doing online gaming like that, it's kind of like only one person can talk at once. So it slows everything down to a CB radio conversation with truckers. So, But if you get a chance to play this thing, I, I, I strongly encourage you to check it out. There's so much design work in here that you can learn from. And in fact, this module had a huge influence on me when I did Chisra and Ceremony two maps in Unreal 1. There's two, like third map in the game was Chisra and Ceremony. I love Mesoamerican stuff. I had a log trap. I didn't blatantly lift the log trap exactly. I did a log trap. I used a Nali Temple to the Water God. So there's a lot of elements. These things influenced me as a young game designer when I was 30 years old and built those maps in Unreal. And, uh, you know, it's worth checking out if you want to check that out too. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Hope you had fun getting this really quick snap overview of this incredible historical module. There is so much in here that's really worth digging into. And what I'd like to do is pick and choose some of my favorite rooms. And I've already got maps drawn up for them. And I want to talk through those rooms and what can happen and tell you, like, how would you run this and how can you make sure it's going to be a lot of fun for your players. I hope you had a lot of fun uh, checking out the show. I know it's a little longer than usual, but this, this module deserves the attention to detail. I swear to God, it's just so incredible and so amazing. And I think if you've never played it, you've got to play it, but be sure you got a really good DM, someone who really enjoys the adventure. They're really going to make it come alive for you. All right, we'll talk to you later. Like, subscribe, share with your friends. If you got a request, you ask me, man, because otherwise I'm just going to keep making up content that I think is cool. I'm more than willing to do something for someone who wants to see something done a certain way. I'm not always right. I didn't design D&D. I'm just a guy who loves that stuff, and I think it should live on forever in everyone's heart and soul. The little kid inside you should carry on forever. Take care, and we'll talk to you soon.